I want to talk today about um, religious freedom, discrimination and living well together. Um, um, uh, just a clarification on what Dad, Dad says, I was only um, president of the Australian Association for the Study of Religion for two years. Um, um, there's been other presidents now. What I want to do in this lecture is, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about religious diversity in Australia and particularly highlight that diversity is the new normal and give you some examples and statistics of that. Then I want to talk about um, Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. Um, it's the most sophisticated um, religious tolerance act in Australia and particularly the case of the um, um, uh, a, a case that was discussed and went on for a long time between some Christians and Muslims that many of you are probably aware of the Catch the Fire Ministries case. And then finally, I want to turn to the Federal Religious Discrimination Bill and talk about um, the treatment of LGBT people and when it is and isn't appropriate to engage in discriminatory practices. The key argument I want to make in today's presentation is that women, married people, divorced people, unmarried mothers, members of religious minorities and LGBTQ people, us people, are all deserving of equality and respect. Even if this makes some conservatives very uncomfortable. And that's the sort of the crucial bit of the argument there. Um, some people think that living well together means that we should all get on really well and be friends and, and never trouble each other. I don't think that living well together, I mean, mostly we can do those sorts of things, but I think that sometimes it requires that um, we do things that make people uncomfortable. Um, and this comes out of the paradox of a tolerance. That is to say, it should be intolerant of intolerance. Um, and that's what I'll be arguing um, as the heart of the lecture. Um, first, some acknowledgements. The, what I, the data and the research that I'm talking about today come out of two large ARC projects that I'm leading, um, funded by the Australian Research Council. Um, there's the project websites there. I'm talking mainly about some research that I've led, but there's some wonderful other research read, led by other people that's on that project website, particularly um, the stuff by Anna Halifoth that you can find on the Religious Diversity website. The Religion and Diversity Project, um, we've um, recently um, passed away Gary Bowler, uh, Anna Halifoth, Greg Barton, Rebecca Banham, Laurie Beeman and Jerry Smith, and the Religious Freedom and LGBT Rights um, Project with um, Simon Rice, Angela Dwyer, Bronwyn Field, Louise Richardson Self, Angus McClay and Laurie Beeman. And both of those teams have just been wonderful, really good people to work with that um, is at the foundation of um, some of the insights that I'm sharing today. So to start with, um, let's look at a graph of religious change in Australia. And um, I want to make three points about this. First of all, traditional Christianity is in decline. Um, new religions are growing and those with non-religions are growing substantially. So if we look first at the Protestants on that um, graph there, the, the Anglicans, the blue line, and the um, MCRPRU, the Methodist Congregational Presbyterian Reform Uniting, the green line, you can see both of them have declined substantially in the last hundred years. The, the first bit of the graph is squashed up a bit. The time scale isn't quite right, but you get the picture. Anglicans used to be, you know, high 30s, nearly 40% of the population. They're now down around 13% of the population. And those statistics are a little deceptive because um, of those who identify as Anglican on the census, now only around about 20% of them attend church several times a year. So the, the decline in um, traditional Protestant religions is more steep than those um, lines suggest. The Catholics are slightly different. Their numbers uh, have gone up a little bit and stabilised, and that reflects the um, post-war migration from places like Italy and Poland, and then more recently Latin America. Um, but again, there's a decline in attendance. So the, the numbers identifying are staying reasonably um, high, but the attendance is um, declining. So although there's, what is it, something like 23% of the population that identify as Catholic now, it's down around about 10% of the population who attend Catholic Church regularly. So traditional Christianity is significantly in decline. 
The second point I'd make is that other religions are growing. And the two there that are growing in the bottom are the Pentecostals and the, the orange line, which is the Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs. Pentecostalism grew mainly in the late 90s, early 2000s as a product of switching from the other churches. It's sort of stabilized now and is not growing so much, just keeping with population growth. Um, the other religions, um, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs, mainly grew as a consequence of um, change migration patterns to Australia. At the end of the White Australia policy, and um, the opening up of migration. So that um, we now have around about a bit more than 2% um, of Buddhist, Buddhists, um, Hindus and Muslims in Australia. And again, those statistics there for both the Pentecostals and the other religions are a little deceptive because the participation rate, that is to say how regularly they attend religious services is much higher for those. So it's around about 75% of Pentecostals attend um, services at least several times a year. So um, the growth of new religions. And then finally, the growth of those who are not religious there. It's gone from what, you know, just about zero in around about 1950 to um, just over 30% of the population at the last census. I actually think it's probably close to 40% of the population because in the census, the religion question is around about, is um, voluntary and around about 10% um, don't answer that question. And some other statistics that I've looked at suggest that most of those who don't respond are actually not religious. Um, I'm anticipating those numbers will be even higher in the 2021 census. I'm guessing that we'll be heading towards 50% of the population that are not religious, if you include the no responders in that. Um, one other statistic that I thought is really interesting out of Gary Baumer's wonderful paper, um, uh, there's a reference at the end um, if you want to look at it, he, he and his colleagues analysed the 2016 census, and although Melbourne has 4.2% Muslims, slightly higher than the rest of Australia, um, the local government areas of places like Broadmeadows and Meadow Heights have 31% and 41% Muslims respectively. So there's some places in Melbourne where um, religion, religious, uh, the religious landscape is completely different. Um, Christianity is now a minority in most places. So we're seeing a, a massive shift in the religious demography in Australia. The thing that I think is interesting about this is that Christianity is moving from a culturally dominant religion to being one among many. And I think that change is um, difficult for some people to negotiate. It makes some conservative Christians extremely uncomfortable. Um, conservative Christian views can now no longer be taken for granted. There's a transition that happens somewhere around about 1990 when um, Christians would um, be quoted in the mainstream newspapers and press and um, they stopped quoting the Bible. Um, you go before 1990 and they would quote the Bible to support their views, whereas if you look at the, um, the, the conservative Christian contribution to the same-sex marriage debate, um, they hardly ever quoted the Bible. They made secular arguments um, for their views. And I think that reflects the fact that um, the Christian worldview is now no longer taken for granted. And this is deeply unsettling for some people. Um, so I want to talk now... Um, uh, just to go back to that one a little bit more, um, uh, two of my, some of my colleagues, um, Louise Richardson Self, Angus McClay, and um, Eleni Poulos are, are writing an article about that um, at the moment. So look out for that when it comes out. And I think that this discomfort, this move from being culturally dominant to being one among many is something that we need to consider. So um, as part of the Religion and Diversity Project, uh, Rebecca Banham, Laurie Beeman and I um, looked at the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. And we did two things. Um, we interviewed 12 people. Um, it sounds like a small number, but these people were very difficult to find. They were key cases, often people who had attended um, um, uh, cases before VCAT that hears cases under the, the Act. Um, and so they were people who had um, significant interests in what was going on. And we also got a very good range of diversity, um, including Christians, uh, religious minorities, and, and other people who were interested in it. We also examined all the public cases relating to religion that were heard um, at VCAT. 
Um, for those of you not familiar with the legislation, what it does is prohibits on the ground of religious belief or activity of another person or class of persons from engaging in contact that incites hatred against, serious contempt for, or revulsion or severe ridicule of that other person or class of persons. So it, it constrains what people can say and do about um, people because of their religion. The most famous case um, in relation to this was the Islamic Council of Victoria um, versus Catch the Fire Ministries. Catch the Fire Ministries is an evangelical Christian group. And it related to a seminar, a newsletter, and an article which were claimed to include statements to the effect that Muslims were prone to violence, were liars, and planned to overthrow Western democracy. Uh, it was went through a number of appeals and was eventually resolved in 2007 through mediation. A joint statement was released in which both parties affirmed and recognised the dignity and worth of every human being, irrespective of the faith, the rights of all persons to express their own religious belief, and the value of friendship, respect and cooperation between Christian Muslim, Christians, Muslims and all other faiths. Um, this is a significantly different position from the initial position of Catch the Fire, um, who were really opposed to Islam. So there's been uh, a change through the process of um, um, the litigation and the case that went before the tribunal and then the appeals. I'm less interested in that specific case than the broader context consequence of that law. So there's a bunch of other cases that I don't have time to talk about um, involving discrimination against Sikhs and LGBT people and uh, Orthodox uh, student um, that are really interesting. Um, but what I think the Act does is it shapes the way that we understand religious uh, diversity more broadly. And this is called the shadow of the law. It's less about the specific case than the way that people then change their behaviour because they're aware of these cases. And I think what the Act does is it does two things. First of all, it creates a culture of trust in civil authorities among Muslims and other religious minorities. So Hanifa Dean in her book on that particular case points out that the Muslims um, didn't go to their local imam and ask him to preach a fiery sermon, or they didn't go to their local church and set it on fire. What they did was they went to court and used that as a place to express their concerns or the tribunal more specifically. And this is a very good thing. This is what we want. If people have passionate and difficult disagreements around religion, taking them to court and dealing with them in a structured way where you have to listen to each other's position and, and think through how to deal with this is a really good way of dealing with religious conflict. The second point I'd make about the Act is that it's prevented Islamophobic speech. And I think you can see this in the way that some public figures have talked about Muslims. They're aware, even though the, the Act relates to Victoria, the, you know, the nature of media and that sort of stuff means that people have to be aware of what they say. And um, I think this is important because Muslims are deserving of equality and respect. They don't deserve to be vilified or discriminated against. But we can make a more general argument that this actually benefits the whole of society. Mark Sageman has an excellent book um, where he analyzes uh, hundreds of cases in the US and Europe of homegrown Islamic terrorism. And, and there's some issues to do with his argument and development since, but, since, but I think that the core argument is a good one. He makes the argument that one of the things that creates homegrown Islamic terrorism, terrorists, is when um, political leaders um, make Islamic, public Islamic phobic statements. So if there's a perception that somehow the government or political leadership is attacking Islam, then the very small minority of Muslims who are likely to be ra radicalised become more likely to be radicalised. So in some ways, you could argue that the Act has contributed to Australia not having very many homegrown um, Islamic terrorists. Um, so I think it's, it's beneficial in a number of ways. When you look at some of the public commentary on um, the Act, um, conservative Christian commentators are heavily, have heavily criticised it as constraining freedom of speech and freedom of religion. 
I actually am not this worried. I'm not that worried by this discomfort. I think that it's an acceptable outcome if some people are uncomfortable with the way that this act constrains them. Um, and I think their discomfort comes out of um, Christian privilege. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, what's interesting is when you look at all the cases that have gone before the tribunal, the main thing that Christians, uh, the, the, uh, the Christians in the cases that have gone before the tribunal are arguing is the, the, they want the right to practice discrimination towards others. Um, there are some, you know, there, there are Christians supporting the Muslims, for example. I think they, um, um, uh, the Victorian Catholics supported the Muslims. So there are Muslims, uh, there, are, there are Christians on both sides. But um, there's clearly a group who are arguing for the right to discriminate and to um, engage in behaviour that we, that would be contrary to that. And, and so the Act protects minorities from harm. And I think this is a really important outcome of what it does. It challenges privilege and protects minorities from harm. When you look at what the religious minorities want when they take cases before the tribunal, they see the Act as a stepping stone towards equality. So they're looking for protection from discrimination. A halal shop is vandalized. A Sikh is pushed violently off a train. An orthodox child is prevented from enrolling at a school. So what the Act does is it provides them of a venue for being able to argue for equal treatment in society. And um, there's a couple of really interesting cases there um, in, in the, and we talk about them in the article, where people took um, a case to the tribunal and then the organisation realised that they were being discriminatory and changed their practices. So these sorts of things are really constructive, I think, and, and helpful in the way that society is organised. Um, I, uh, Laurie Beeman, and Rebecca Banham and I, in the article we wrote about this, called this legal animism, agonism. It's not deep equality that um, Laurie Beeman wrote about in a book by that name, which is deep equality is where we all get on well together, treating each other respectfully in everyday practices. It's also not the cosmopolitan inclusiveness um, that Anna Halifold talks about so beautifully in her work on interfaith. Um, Legal agonism is where the problematic views are probably retained. So I haven't um, studied Catch the Fire Ministries since um, the case. I don't know whether what I'm saying here is correct or not, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if they're still deeply distrustful of Muslims. Um, but what happens is that there, the expression of these views is constrained because of a commitment to rule of law. So the rule of law stops people from engaging in activities that will be harmful to others and harmful to the broader society. Another way of putting this is to say that living well together will sometimes make people very uncomfortable. And this is OK. This is an acceptable outcome of laws that are designed to protect um, people from discrimination. Okay, so I want to talk now um, about the Federal Religious Discrimination Bill. Um, I'm sure most of you will be aware of it and the various iterations that it's gone through. Um, prior to the 2017 marriage equality vote, some Catholic leaders threatened to fire teachers, nurses, and other employees who marry their same-sex partner if gay marriage is legalized. Now, this would be illegal in non-religiously affiliated hospitals, schools, and social services. They wouldn't be allowed to do this. But it's legal in some states for some religiously affiliated organisations. The, the, the law is complex and technical here. But simplistically, it's um, legal in New South Wales, but not in Tasmania. Victoria has just changed their law. So in one of the papers that we published on this, we interviewed a number of LGBTQ teachers who um, lost their jobs during the same-sex marriage debate in um, New South Wales because their sexuality came out as a product of um, the debate and discussions around it. And in New South Wales, it's possible to sack these people simply for their sexuality or gender. What the federal bill would do, among other things, is make these discriminatory practices allowable nationally. So it would override Tasmania's legislation and Victoria's legislation. I also, before talking um, about some of the statistics, I want to just note that um, 
Um, Christians provide key government funded services for the general public. Um, and that this institutional power is part of the privilege of Christianity, the power of Christianity. Um, and I'm not thinking of some of the religious services that you might think of, such as a, you know, a soup kitchen or something like that. Um, the um, programs to assist unemployed people to find work again are run by religiously affiliated social welfare organisations, um, some of them. Um, this was a product of, I think it was the Howard reforms, where reforms, where previously um, uh, services that were previously run by uh, secular government agencies were transferred to religiously affiliated organisations. So the programs for early intervention to children and families at risk of domestic violence, say. Um, and these programs are run by religiously affiliated organisations. So they're government funded services for the general public. Catholic education is an interesting example of this, and I pick on it because um, Catholic education is the biggest um, uh, non-government education system in Australia. In 2008, 25% of students um, at Catholic schools were not Catholics. Now it's 34% and it's growing. And of those who are Catholics, I suspect many of them are nominal Catholics. That is to say, they probably don't attend um, church regularly. So. Um, uh, we can talk more about this in, in, the, um, in the discussion, um, but ca Catholic education is looking more and more, uh, less and less like a religious service provided by religious people to religious people, and more like a government funded service provided by a religiously affiliated organisation to the general population. Um, so it's changing. I'd also note that Christian organisations receive tens of billions of dollars in government funding every year. I haven't done an exact calculation of it. Angus McClay, um, who's working on um, the Religious Freedom and LGBT um, project with me, um, was looking at uh, some of the biggest um, uh, religiously affiliated organisations in New South Wales, and they alone were getting over a billion dollars in government funding every year. So if we went nationally, it would be a huge amount of money. Christianity is central to Australian society because Christians control some really large organisations that provide education, social welfare, health care and aged care. Upward of one third of jobs in these sectors um, are in religiously affiliated um, uh, workplaces. So in the education system, a third of jobs there are in religiously affiliated schools. It's much higher in aged care. So there's this huge institutional power that is a key part of Christian privilege in Australian society that gives them huge influence and power um, in Australian society. So what we did, um, OSA is a, a national representative survey, and we put five questions in the survey. We have an article on this that's coming out um, very soon. Um, the survey for this little bit, there were uh, 11, about 1,100 people who answered the question. The two questions I want to talk about today, first one was, do you agree or disagree um, that conservative, Catholic, Anglican, Jewish and Muslim schools should be allowed to refuse to employ a teacher because they are LGBT plus? 73% of Australians disagree and only 19% agree. So basically, the vast majority of Australians do not think that religiously affiliated schools should be engaging in, the, in discriminatory practices towards LGBT people. The second question that I want to talk about today that we asked was um, a conservative, do you agree or disagree, a conservative re religiously affiliated social welfare organisation providing accommodation to homeless people should be allowed to redirect direct uh, LGBT plus homeless people to seek welfare assistance from another organisation. 74% disagree, only 16% agree. So the vast majority of Australians do not agree that um, religiously affiliated organisations should be allowed to discriminate in the provision of government funded services to the general population, which is what both of these things are. To go down a little bit more, um, and these numbers are a little more um, rubbery because the, they're smaller. There's 180 Catholics, 100 Anglicans. 
130 people who attend um, services regularly, but nonetheless, they give us a, a sort of ballpark indication. With the, uh, um, do you think religiously affiliated schools should be allowed to discriminate against LGBT teachers? Only 20% of Catholics agree, 25% of Anglicans, and 41% of those who attend religious services at least monthly, or I, though I'm a little um, suspicious of that number because uh, I think it, it might be lower because um, the survey was run at the time when Melbourne was in lockdown. So um, there may be factors that influence that. I haven't looked at it, but it gives us a ballpark indication. Um, and also with coalition um, voters, uh, only 26% agree, and it's about the same or a bit less even, I think, for unaffiliated voters. So basically what these statistics tell us is that the vast majority of Australians, even within the religious groups, don't agree that um, uh, religiously affiliated organisations should be allowed to discriminate. The other point I'd make is that LGBT discrimination causes serious harm uh, in the paper um, that you can go and read, we provide a, a long list of the evidence of the harm caused by discrimination toward LGBT people. But let me just give you this one quote from Jesuit Social Services, uh, Norden's 2006 study of Catholic schools. He heard stories of depression, isolation and discrimination in Catholic schools. A consequence of this discrimination for same-sex attracted young people is that they have increased rates of homelessness, risk-taking behaviour, depression, suicide, and episodes of self-harm compared to young heterosexuals. So these discriminatory practices are not insignificant. They cause substantial harm both to um, teachers and students, to people who work in these organisations and to the people who access services that they provide. I also want to make the point that religions are permitted to discriminate in their own religious organisations. There's no political debate about um, discrimination in temples, churches and synagogues. The Catholic Church, for example, discriminates against women, married men, unless you're a particular category of Anglican clergy, and, and publicly gay men. You can't become part of the clergy. You know? So there's no political debate about this. The debate is in the government funded provision of services to the general public. I'd argue that these should not be provided on a discriminatory basis, either to those employed in the service or those accessing the service. Um, I'd argue that women, married people, divorced people, LGBT people are all deserving of equality and respect. Similarly, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs and other religions are deserving of equality and respect, even if this makes people, some people very uncomfortable, a very small minority, um, are very uncomfortable engaging in respectful behaviour, treating these groups of people equally. I don't think that should change the way that we um, uh, that these services are provided. Um, so just to end here, um, I've gone a little bit over time. I hope that's okay. Um, we ran another survey um, that uh, we haven't published yet. It was a large online survey where we invited pe um, religious people to talk about their attitudes towards LGBT people. And a Muslim man wrote this um, comment in at the end of the survey. He said, as a Muslim, we are very used to laws and norms in this country not reflecting our way of life. We don't have that feeling of our society getting away from us because it was never ours to begin with. There are all sorts of things in this society that are considered completely normal but are prohibited for Muslims. We have, by and large, found this third space where we can practice our faith and respect others who live differently. Perhaps there is something conservative Christians can learn from us. Wise words from a Muslim. And thank you. Um, there's the sources, um, the various papers that I've drawn on. Um, you can find links to all of them on the project websites. Um, so if you want to go and look at them, they're all there.